And welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. This week on Ask an Atheist, we're doing something different. We're featuring a presentation delivered at our 2021 National Convention in Boston, Massachusetts. Today's show is pre-recorded, so we won't be able to take live questions. Linda Greenhouse is an author and columnist for the New York Times. She spoke on the disturbing trends moving toward the overthrow of Roe v. Wade. So my, my little talk uh, actually has, has a title, and the title is Cheesecake Anyone? I will explain, but, but first I, I, I'm adding a thought uh, from what I had previously written based on what I heard this morning. And um, I, I think the day so far has just been fascinating. As, as, I mean, I, I won't even list the parts of the program that, that really got my attention because they, they all did. Uh, but I heard the couple of shout outs to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, well deserved. I mean, by the end of her time on the court, she was certainly the, the most dedicated separationist um, among the justices, but I also wanted to give a shout out uh, to another distinguished woman who served on the court, Sandra Day O'Connor. And you know, she's, she's not much in the news anymore. Uh, she left the court in beginning of 2006. Uh, she's 90 years old. She's been living with dementia for several years. But I just want to quote from something she wrote in her last published opinion in uh, the summer of 2005, when she uh, concurred with Justice David S Souter uh, in an opinion that um, invalidated the display of a, a, a Ten Commandments display on the courthouse walls in McCrary County, Kentucky. Some of you may remember that case. And in agreeing with the majority that this display violated the Establishment Clause, Here's what she said. I just thought it was worth bringing it to your attention. She said, at a time when we see around the world the violent consequences of the assumption of religious authority by government, Americans may count themselves fortunate. Those who would renegotiate the boundaries between church and state must therefore answer a difficult question. Why would we trade a system that has served us so well for one that has served others so poorly, right? That's a question that I think, <laughs> FFRF really exists to answer, right? to, to bring the public's attention to the real meaning of, of that question. Um, so I didn't start out seeking to chronicle the theocratizing of America uh, with the lines that Annie Laurie quoted. Um, I just kept my eyes open and that's what I saw. And when I sat down to start writing the, my new book, Justice on the Brink, I didn't anticipate that it was really gonna be a, in, in large measure a chronicle of what happened to the continued effacement of the Establishment Clause and the continued elevation of the Free Exercise Clause during the last term of the court, <clears throat> the term with, three, with the three Trump-appointed justices, uh, which is what the book is about. And the very first thing that happened after Amy Coney Barrett came on the court uh, at the end of October a year ago, um, people may remember it was, it was Thanksgiving Eve that the court on the so-called shadow docket um, elevated uh, religion over public health in striking down the uh, New York limitation on gatherings uh, for any purpose, but including the purpose of, of worship. And that was a flip from the uh, rulings the court had handed down when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still in that seat uh, where the court had uh, chosen public health over religious exercise. So that was a very major turning point uh, and a very disturbing one. Anyway, even, even were I not receiving this wonderful award, which is very meaningful to me, because I have followed FFRF's um, 
activities for many years uh, with admiration. Uh, it would be an honor and a pleasure simply to be here among people who aren't shy about challenging the surge in religiosity that's sweeping across our supposedly secular country. So as Annie Laurie in the quote she gave from one of my recent columns uh, you know, pointed out, of course, uh, this is something that I've been looking at closely for some time through the perspective, from the perspective of the Supreme Court. But of course, the court is a reflection, not really a source of this problem. Supreme Court justices don't fall from the sky, and the makeup of the current court is a reflection of our politics. So I don't mean to let the court off the hook for a series of decisions that have placed religion in an ever greater position of privilege that would have astounded our Constitution's framers, to whom conservative judges and justices purport to pay so much homage. I'm only suggesting that we, the people, pave the way to the Supreme Court that we have today, either by active participation or by passive acquiescence in the wave of religiosity that has deposited the most recent justices on the court's bench. What I think distinguishes FFRF is its refusal to stand silently by, as so many people do, even those who, who are disturbed by this. Uh, to stand silent is to enable, and that's the quote that uh, Annie Laurie put up on the, on the screen there, uh, Religion, as I've written, is the last taboo. And I think that's proven by who's, I was shocked earlier to see that major TV networks are refusing to run uh, the FFRF uh, ad with, with Ron Reagan. Um, and that's just an example, you know, we can't talk about it. Uh, unlike when most of us grew up, we can talk about all kinds of things. But to comment on the fact that the last three Republican presidents have placed a total of five conservative Catholics on the Supreme Court, I mean doctrinally conservative, not simply politically conservative, because after all, Catholicism is a, is a big tent, uh, is a spectrum, but these justices happen to come from the most doctrinally conservative end of the spectrum, and you risk being considered at best rude or even bigoted. Uh, but to remain silent in the face of this really quite astonishing fact is to become an enabler. So what I admire about FFRF is that you refuse to be enablers. So, so what could I possibly mean by the title of my talk, Cheesecake, Anyone? <clears throat> Question mark. I know that I stand between you and dinner, so I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't mean to put, I don't mean to obsess on this image of dessert, but here's something you, you might want to know. Last month, one of our great federal appeals courts, the Sixth Circuit, declared <clears throat> that Jewish prison inmates have a legal right to be served cheesecake on the Jewish holiday of Shavuos. I'm letting this sink in, okay? You heard that right. The court, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, which covers Ohio, Kentucky, and Michigan, uh, which is where this case arose, a case called Ackerman against Washington, <clears throat> I'm guessing that some of this audience have some acquaintance with Jewish tradition and practice, as I do. For those from Christian backgrounds, Shavuos is revelation, the handing down of the Ten Commandments. So what on heaven or earth does this have to do with cheesecake? This is the story. The Michigan Department of Corrections makes vegan kosher meals available to any prisoner with a religious objection to eating the standard diet, whether Jewish or Muslim or whatever, if they don't want to eat the prison's meat and so on, they, get a, they can offer a vegan diet, a universal meal for prisoners with any religious objection to what they would otherwise be fed. Two Jewish inmates challenge the prison's practice, claiming that based on their religious beliefs, they were entitled to kosher meat on the Sabbath and to a dairy meal on Shavuos. Not just a generic dairy meal, but uh, according to one of the inmates, cheesecake. Testifying at trial, this inmate, who claimed familiarity with Jewish law, first said that, quote, Shavuos is genuinely associated with cheesecake in the Jewish community. 
But he later qualified that remark to say that eating cheesecake was in fact required by Jewish law. This is not true. I know that this is not true. The district court <clears throat> then ordered the prison system to provide kosher meat to the prisoners requesting it on the Jewish Sabbath and to provide cheesecake on Shavuos. The prison system appealed to the Sixth Circuit, challenging the sincerity of the prisoners' claims. But the Sixth Circuit affirmed the district court, crediting the inmates' sincerity and noting that both had grown up eating kosher food at home, I guess before they turned to a life of crime. And <laughs> two of the three judges on the appellate panel, by the way, were appointed by Donald Trump, but that's almost irrelevant, as you'll see as, as I go on with this analysis. <clears throat> so writing for the panel, uh, one of these judges, John Nalbandian, said that while the kosher meat claim for the Sabbath was in fact an easy question for him, of course they're entitled to kosher meat on the Sabbath if that's what they want, uh, the cheesecake claim was indeed, quote, trickier. The judge observed that, quote, religious texts don't say that cheesecake is mandatory. He did a study of this. He cited a note in the Code of Jewish Law that, quote, some have a custom to just eat some dairy on this holiday. So why wasn't that the end of it? It's not in Jewish law, and so you're not entitled to, you know, more entitled to cheesecake than anybody else, or then a Christian inmate would say, I'm entitled to you know, nice colored eggs on Easter or whatever. Why, did, why didn't a finding of no religious requirement equate to a finding of no entitlement, right? Aha, uh -huh. and I quote from the opinion, quote, but there's also evidence suggesting that these prisoners do in fact sincerely believe that the cheesecake is required on Shavuos, unquote. Noting that the district court judge had accepted the prisoner's sincerity on this point, Judge Nalbandian said, quote, that's all that is required. Even if, <clears throat> even if we, may we may have come out differently on this issue, if we were sitting as the district judge, we affirm under the applicable, applicable standard of review, <clears throat> unquote. So theoretically, Michigan might have rebutted this finding by showing that the state had a compelling interest in not yielding to the inmates' request. That's the balancing test, the compelling interest that would be required. The state offered a financial interest. Meeting the dietary demand, the state said, would cost $10,000 a year, and they don't, didn't want to be required to spend that. But the Sixth Circuit rejected that as a compelling interest, noting that the prison system's annual budget was $39 million and that an additional $10,000 represented, quote, just a tiny 0.02% in that multi-million dollar food budget bucket. The court did not seem to <clears throat> buy the argument that this was a slippery slope, and if you had to provide Shavuos on, uh, if you had to provide cheesecake on Shavuos for two inmates, who knows what might come next, filet mignon for, well, you, you, can, you can figure that out. Now, I'm no expert in Jewish law, but I was actually married, my husband and I were actually married in an Orthodox synagogue, so I'm here to tell you that this is not a religious requirement. Uh, it's fun to have cheesecake on Shavuos, it's fun to have nicely colored eggs on Easter, uh, but in both cases, how did we come to a point where a federal appeals court issues a 23-page opinion addressing a matter that to a person without a stake in the outcome would appear frivolous even, it might even strike some of you in this room as ridiculous. The fact of the matter is that when it comes to religious claims, nothing under the way the law has developed is frivolous and nothing is ridiculous. Given where the Supreme Court has driven the law, in fact, the chain of reasoning that produced the outcome of this case was completely plausible, even predictable. The case was litigated under a 20-year-old federal law the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, known as RELUPA. And that law provides that the government must show a compelling interest to justify imposing, quote, a substantial burden on the religious exercise of a person residing in or confined to an institution, unquote. Religious exercise, in turn, as defined as, quote, any exercise of religion, whether or not compelled by or central to a system of religious belief, unquote. 
So given that statutory language, it's hardly surprising that the Supreme Court has interpreted the law as triggered by any, quote, sincere belief, no matter how unfounded. And if all that matters is sincerity, who, after all, is to judge? The law essentially enables judges, if so inclined, to take themselves out of the role of judging. To this effect, it mirrors a companion federal law, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, which was the law at issue in the Hobby Lobby case, you may remember, that the Supreme Court decided in 2014. That was the case about whether a corporation with a religious owner could exempt itself from the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare's mandate to provide birth control as part of employee, the employee health care benefit. The owner of Hobby Lobby claimed that he couldn't possibly abide by this mandate because certain forms of birth control caused abortion. That's actually not true. It doesn't happen to be true, but it was ostensibly the man's belief. So the court credited it and ruled in the Hobby Lobby case, ruled in Hobby Lobby's favor to the detriment of thousands of women. Hobby Lobby is a big national corporation with many employees all over the country and others who work for such employers and as a result have been deprived of an employment benefit enjoyed or contemplated by Congress and enjoyed by women who are lucky enough to work for companies that actually are willing to obey the law. So my point in telling you the cheesecake story then is really about a lot more than cheesecake. In context, the Sixth Circuit opinion was not crazy. It was, in fact, completely predictable, completely understandable. It's the law itself that has gone off the rails in full view of anyone who cared to watch. Prisoners can be denied decent medical care, can be abused by guards. Of course, they forfeit various rights of citizenship, including the right to vote, but by God, let them eat cheesecake. Something is seriously out of balance, and by the end of the current Supreme Court term, and you heard some reference to this uh, in the earlier presentations, it's likely to become even more out of balance, and the situation urgently requires our attention. I am comforted by not very much about this, but I am comforted by the fact that the FFRF will keep doing its part. Thank you for this award, and thank you very much. Thank you for watching this week's Ask an Atheist. If you like what you saw, be sure to join us at the next FFRF National Convention. This year it will be in San Antonio, Texas, October 28 through 30. Confirmed speakers include the best-selling author, John Irving, Texas journalism legend, Jim Hightower, atheist and LGBTQ Nebraska state legislator, Megan Hunt, and many more. We would love to see you there in person. We'll be back next Wednesday at noon central with FFRF's Ask an Atheist.